Hello and welcome. This is Understanding Existentialism and my name is Mark Thorsby. In this video we're going to be talking about Friedrich Nietzsche's philosophy of existence. Uh, by no means is this a thorough introduction or discussion of Nietzsche's works, but uh, we will be taking a close look at some of his work in the gay science um, as well as on the genealogy of morality and some of his notebooks. So that's kind of what we're going to be looking at today. Talk a little bit quickly about who Friedrich Nietzsche was. Um, he lived from 1844 to 1900, so really um, an important figure within the 19th century. Um, he was born in um, Roken, Saxony, which at the, that time was a part of Prussia. Um, his father was a Lutheran minister, so he grew up actually with uh, being exposed to a very devout religious family. Um, but his father died when he was five. His mother raised him. She was also a very devout woman in terms of her Lutheran um, religious beliefs. And now it become important because we'll see that Nietzsche is very much um, a reaction, or you might understand him biograph biographically as a reaction against um, precisely those values um, that he was raised with. Um, he was educated in classical languages and literature. In particular, his subject matter was philology. Um, he was a professor of philology at Basel University from 1869 to 1879 for really a short 10-year period. Now, I should mention, though, that he became a full professor of Basel because he, he was a star, as it were, an intellectual star in philology as a young man. And so people predicted him to be the greatest philologist that you know had lived up to that point. Um, he was extremely prolific. Uh, but he disappointed everyone uh, with his first book in 1872 called The Birth of Tragedy, which in many ways was influenced, um, or Nietzsche, which resembles some of the influence that Nietzsche had after he began reading Arthur Schopenhauer, who's another important um, philosopher of the period, um, and who really introduces the notion of the world is godless, and he initiates what was sometimes referred to as a philosophical pessimism. So in 1872, Nietzsche publishes The Birth of Tragedy, in which, and we'll talk a little bit about it later in the book, uh, in the video, but we're not going to talk too much about it. But in The Birth of Tragedy, he proposes a new way of interpreting Greek tragedy, one that very much was um, unpopular. Um, in 1879 to 1889, effectively after he left the University of Basel, um, he had a prolific period of writing. Much of the works we're looking at come from that period. Um, and... Um, it's really within these really short 10 years that um, the Nietzsche, who is shaken 20th century philosophy, really emerges. Um, in the last decade of his life, tragically, he was uh, marred by disability and ultimately insanity. Um, the last 10 years of his life, he barely spoke. Um, and there's a lot of questions about that. And you can take a look at some of the biographies of Nietzsche who speculate on what illness he had. It seems likely, though, that Nietzsche probably died of contracting syphilis, um, which would account for ultimately his eventual catatonic state. Um, so it's sort of sad. I mean, there's lots more we could talk about because most of his works, um, even though he did publish other works, um, particularly we'll look at some of those, those works like or we'll mention them, such as Thus Spoke Zarathustra. But much of his works that we're looking at here come from his notebooks he was writing and working on. Um, and so eventually all of this would be, after his death, um, edited and then published by his sister. Uh, and there's a lot of um, criticism about uh, his sister and the way in which she went about publishing his works and editing them. Um, and there, so there's a lot of uh, Nietzschean scholarship that goes along with this philosopher. Um, we're not going to talk too much about that. Uh, we're going to really just dive into instead Nietzsche's discussion of morality in the gay science and in his text on the genealogy of morality. Um, so that's what we're going to be taking a look at today primarily. Some of the central themes that we're going to talk about, they're going to become really important as we walk through Nietzsche's work and, and we can't we're not reading passages where he talks about all of this stuff um, but I'll try to reference and talk about all of it as we go it's first and foremost that Nietzsche um, has an epistemological perspectivism epistemology of course refers to a theory of knowledge in Nietzsche's view is that all of our knowledge is ultimately grounded um, by the perspectives we have um, as people so that means that I wouldn't say that he's a relativist um, he, he may be um, 
But I think what we could say is that his view is that no matter that every philosophical insight we might have and all these views are all just perspectives that are grounded in our own position as subjects and, and as thinkers. Um, and as a result, we can never get out of our perspectives. Um, so, and that has a huge ramification on ultimately all of these questions. Uh, but we'll see Nietzsche today discuss this perspective in, in some depth. Um, another central insight that comes out of Nietzsche is the notion of the death of God. Um, and unfortunately, I'm not choosing the passage in the gay science where he talks about the death of God. Um, we're going to kind of just take that on. But, uh, but what he does say is that, for instance, that God, at one point he says in the gay science, God is dead and we are his murderers. We are all his murderers, his killers. Now, Nietzsche officially right, is an atheist, so he doesn't believe that God ever existed. But when we talk about the death of God, what we're talking about is the importance that God plays conceptually for our understanding of the meaning of things. Because all of us are each individuals, we're human beings, um, but none of us are transcendent, right? And God has always played a transcendental role in philosophy, or the divine is always associated with it. So for instance, Plato argues that the highest forms are divine. Aristotle argues that the unmoved mover is divine, and so on and so forth. And you can actually trace through the notion of God in the history of philosophy. And what you'll discover is that God has a functional role. And the functional role of God has been to be the guarantor, the transcendental stop, um, at which point the, me the, the question of meaning can be laid to rest. And also God guarantees that um, how we understand our moral values are ultimately guaranteed to be correct. We're going to see here, though, that Nietzsche's view was that ultimately God was um, a fiction that human beings needed in order to psychologically survive. Um, and that ultimately moral values got infused in that notion. And then eventually over time, um, he thinks that by the time he's writing in the 19th century, God has essentially already got, in other words, people no longer really live in such a way where they need God. It's no longer functionally necessary, yet everyone pretends like it still is. So remember, when Nietzsche's writing, Europe is still heavily Christian. Today, if we took a look at Europe, we'd see that the majority of Europe today is are either secularist or atheist. Um, but in Nietzsche's day, the majority are still Christians. And that's not to say there aren't lots of Christian communities in Europe today, there are. Um, but by and large, right, there's been a de-Christianization of Europe within the 20th century that we don't see taking, we haven't seen take place, for instance, in the United States. Uh, but it did take, it has taken place effectively in Europe. And so, uh, but Nietzsche sort of, in his day, People are living in such a way that God is no longer a necessary part of their life. God is dead because they're no longer living like it's real. Remember the notion of existentialism, existence precedes essence. Uh, how people exist is ultimately the defining feature of the meaning of their lives. And they're no longer existing. And in, in other passages, Nietzsche is heavily critical of, for instance, capitalism. Um, and, you know, really anything, many, many aspects of European life, political institutions and the rest. Uh, but he thinks that all of those function on this sort of transcendental guarantee. Think about, for instance, the Constitution, or no, I'm sorry, the Bill of Rights, where it says, um, we are endowed by our Creator with inalienable freedoms right, and rights. Um, that, even in the Constitution of the United States, which is from an uh, earlier period, but not that much earlier, also has, it, has, as it were, God as a transcendental guarantee of justice. So, Nietzsche's view is that this is going away. And what's happening is Europe now is living under a moral system that no longer works. Um, and this creates a problem of nihilism, we'll see. And nihilism is the notion of meaninglessness. And we'll even look at today Nietzsche's definition and his distinctions of nihilism. But nihilism effectively, the problem of nihilism is if there is no God to guarantee the meaning of my life, uh, or, and think about this, I'm living my life, I'm making meaning, but I'm going to die. And then what will be the meaning of my life? It appears to be meaningless, right? This is the problem of nihilism. Um, it's really, we're going to see in Nietzsche's view, a psychological reaction. Um, we'll also talk about the concept of the will to power, which is a central notion. We'll see in many ways, Nietzsche is a forerunner to um, a more modern conception of psychology, where he articulates that there are certain drives and instincts which are motivating human beings' actions. 
human actions. And the will to power is the fundamental concept or one of them. And this is the drive we each have to enable, to, to gain more power in our lives, right? We have a fundamental will to power. And this, Nietzsche thinks, is a natural account of the human animal. And therefore, a naturalistic account of moral value has to begin by looking at those things. So Nietzsche's view is that if we want to understand the history and the origin of morality, we have to first understand the type of animals we are and understand the what makes us tick, you might say, or what our psychological drives, instincts, and dispositions are. We'll talk a little bit about the eternal return at the end, and I'm not going to say too much about that now, but it's a great concept that puts it all together. Um, and the other thing I will mention is that, or a central theme you'll see is that for Nietzsche, um, philosophy is no longer a question of developing a metaphysics of being, but instead philosophy has become a historical project. And so there's this notion of historical philosophizing. We might say this is Nietzsche's method. So his method, for instance, we might say is to take our concepts, that are our moral concepts in particular, historic, look at their historical origins. Um, in conjunction with these aspects of human psychology in order to have a better, more naturalistic account of nature. What we might say, or what the editor for our textbook says, is the, de the de deification of nature. Um, and within that, we're talking about human beings, we're social animals, and so Nietzsche also recognized that we have a natural herd instinct. Um, that is, a nat we're naturally fall into the crowd. So we'll talk about all of these aspects, which become sort of central forerunners to the to the later existentialist philosophers we're going to look at in the series. So uh, I'm going to jump into the gay science and I'm going to what I'm going to do is I'm going to walk through really I'm going to walk through the gay science very closely and then when we get to the genealogy of morality I'm going to really kind of try to explain it instead of tracing it out in the text but then kind of highlight key elements and then finally we'll conclude our video here with the discussion on nihilism. So starting with the gay science. And by the way, the gay science means the joyful science. And so this is first and foremost the orientation we're going to have to take as we read Nietzsche, is that for Nietzsche, the recognition that God is dead and the, the problem of nihilism, these also mean that philosophy can finally do something new. Uh, that philosophy, uh, a new philosophy is actually possible. So that's a, and he says that the right reaction to that is joy because happiness can return. We can think fresh. Uh, so there's something, so it's called the joyful science. Um, and it's really kind of a walkthrough of his central ideas. Now, where are we reading this from? Uh, we're reading from the Norton Anthology of Western Philosophy after Kant, the interpretive tradition. So all the page numbers I have come from there. Uh, but if you have a copy of the gay science, um, as I go through, you'll see the section numbers are the same. Um, and I try to I let you know where I'm at when I'm looking through the genealogy of morality if you have a, your own translation. Another thing I'll mention about reading Nietzsche is that Nietzsche is, I think, personally, the most beautiful writer of all the philosophers I've ever read. Um, his writing is gorgeous. Um, so there's lots of metaphors, lots of imagery. Um, it's also a lot of wandering at times. Um, he generally writes in, in either fragmented essays or he writes in aphorisms. Um, and he frequently, and this is what he what makes him such a powerful writer, he'll frequently use images and metaphors and analogies in order to help you see his point clearly. Um, and he's really masterful at it. So if anything, you should enjoy the literary nature of Nietzsche's writings, though you may find that the content of his ideas are quite challenging at times. Um, in many ways, they represent a, probably a challenge to your own moral views. Um, so basically, Nietzsche kind of gets everyone at some point. So I'm starting here in book five, which is subtitled We Fearless Ones. And I'm starting off with, I guess I'll call it section four, uh, 343. Um, and these sections are not labeled, but as the video goes forward here, I'm going to start labeling them. <laughs> um, giving you a sense of title so you kind of get a sense of what the subject's all about. So first and foremost, we begin, Nietzsche begins with the discussion of the death of God, which he says is a great and recent event. He writes, the event itself is far too great, too distant, too remote from the multitude's capacity for comprehension. So what we're talking about here is that if there is no longer God, 
there is no longer a transcendental universal or absolute right all we have are these perspectives as i mentioned earlier and he thinks that the people in europe don't recognize what that means and it's likely he would say the same is probably true for us is that we don't fully com comprehend um, what that entails because it means that the old european values and for him they're much closer than they are for us but that the old values uh, let's call them the christian values of europe that these values will slowly collapse um, and in fact he seems, seems to argue that in their place new values will be formulated new values out of creative out of a creative response to all the problems we're going to talk about today are going to replace them so the initial consequence for us may be despair, but it should, in fact, be joy. He writes, quote, a new dawn has shone on us. At long last, the horizon appears free to us again, even if it should not be bright. At long last, our ships may venture out again. Right. So you can see it in two different ways. And that's going to be something we're going to see as we talk about um, these problems of meaning and meaninglessness is for Nietzsche, there's always either a, a negative reaction where we can withdraw and internalize it and give up, as it were, or we can become creative and look new. So for the philosophy, in many ways, Nietzsche is, um, sees a new philosophy is actually possible. Um, and it's interesting, Heidegger, who we're going we're gonna to be looking at later on in the, in the series here, Heidegger himself says that philosophy really begins with Plato, but it ends with Nietzsche. Uh, so um, the classical philosophy. And so we'll sort of talk about that as we go. It's going to be a running theme in our discussion of existentialism. So in 344, we have this conception. And again, he doesn't label these. Well, he, he slightly does. He puts them in italics usually in the very first sentence. But is this notion of the will to truth. Now, one of the things that's going to become clearer, I think, as we get to the genealogy of morality. But the will is a psychological concept. So the notion of the will. And of course, the concept of the will itself has a deep history in the history of philosophy. Uh, for instance, um, Descartes makes the will a fundamental faculty um, that's, that actually is you know, the seat of freedom, if you will. So, But for Nietzsche, he's not thinking of the will as some sort of uh, ghostly apparition or soul but rather the will as a psychological um, element, an unconscious element, let's say, in, the, in what drives us to act and live the way we do. So let's go back here. Now, Nietzsche, of course, generally speaking, he, he, you have, we'll follow him through his arguments here. So number one, he says at the very beginning, which I love this, he says, convictions have no right of citizenship in science. So when we talk about science, we're talking about the idea of gaining knowledge about the way things really are. But he says, for instance, our convictions, our beliefs shouldn't have a right when it comes to science. But the problem is our convictions do matter. And there's actually no science that doesn't already have presuppositions within it. And so there's, and what Nietzsche is partially doing here is that what the philosopher aims at or the philosopher wants is a will to truth. So, but what is the will to truth? This unconditional will of truth, what is it? He says, what do you know in advance of the character of existence to be able to decide whether the greater advantage is on the side of the unconditionally mistrustful or the unconditionally trusting? So, for instance, the will to truth has within it the idea that we shouldn't be deceived, right? I don't want to be deceived because I want to know the truth. But it also has within it the supposition that we ourselves should not be deceivers, right? And so Nietzsche says, but wait a second. This notion of the will to truth that it's the heart of philosophy, that's the driver force of philosophy, what is it based upon in terms of existence? And what is it what is it really based upon? And he seems to be suggesting here that we actually don't know. He says the will to truth may actually be concealing a will to death, uh, which is very interesting. And I had to mention this because later on, um, um, Sigmund Freud would also articulate a notion of... Um, uh, uh, a, uh, a will towards death. So there's something interesting there, or an instinct, or a death instinct is what Freud calls it. Uh, so there's some interesting things that are going on here. He writes, it is, it, is a, it is still a metaphysical faith upon which our faith in science rests. So we have this notion that we really do want the truth, we make this assumption, and that the will to truth, quote unquote, is what's driving us towards 
truth of things, right? And so, for instance, the metaphysical faith is the same as what Plato talks about, for instance. Plato, right, uh, he has a, he embodies that there's a will towards truth and through the dialectic as we gain knowledge of the forms, we, we, get, we get to that truth. The notion that God is the truth, the religious truth in Christianity or other religions, and the notion that truth is divine, all of these, for instance, are presuppositions, right? They are, as it were, convictions that we have um, about things. Um, and so one of the things that, that he's going to really sort of un, unfold for us is the notion that, uh, or he's going to undo philosophy, right? And argue that there are other wills potentially at stake. So morality is the problem. Now, all great problems, he says, demand great love, right? Problems are either personal or impersonal, and Nietzsche is of the personal. And we see a similar sort of insistence, first-person insistence in Nietzsche's work uh, that I think is similar to Kierkegaard's. Um, Kierkegaard is interested in truth as a personal problem, not an impersonal one, and the same is true for Nietzsche as well, right? He says, quote, I've never yet encountered anybody, not even in books, who approached morality in this personal way and knew morality as a problem. Um, in fact, he says people who do who um, see problems in an impersonal way are usually boring and don't say much of interest. Uh, so for him, it needs to be a personal problem. Um, and it, it certainly was a personal problem for him. In fact, in our readings, we see Nietzsche actually even discuss, as a, I think it's in the notebooks, as a child, when he was a kid, how he became very much interested in this problem of evil and what evil was. And he actually said, God is the creator of evil. That was his, that was his conclusion. Of course, he says, I've changed my mind on, you know, I don't understand things quite that way anymore. Right. But for him, for Nietzsche, morality is a problem and it's very personal to him. And he says that a critique of moral valuations is needed. For example, uh, for instance, we often have the assumption that a moral action should be selfless, sacrificial, we should be sympathetic to others, and all these sorts of things. Think, for instance, the way in which um, uh, we talk about tolerating people of different views, and the way in which we celebrate diversity. And I'm not denying those things, but notice here that those all have them, have value and moral assumptions within them. And we normally just take it as an assumption, but the point here is that we need to become critical of these valuations in order to ascertain what they mean and where their origin is and how we can understand it in a naturalistic fashion rather than in a theological one. Now, there's a demand here for the unconditioned validity of moral valuations, and Nietzsche says that's childish. Um, we, we often want to say that... Um, the, the idea that you ought to be compassionate towards other people is unconditionally valid. And Nietzsche basically says, listen, that's, child's, that's childish because you're trying to take something that probably fits in one way and make it fit in every case. Just the way in which a child who learns one thing thinks they know everything. Um, so he says this is, an, this is childish and we shouldn't assume that a critique of moral valuations can only end by um, validating these sorts of ver values and virtues, right? So he says, our task is ultimately to question and examine the values and the moral system that we're a part of, or that, or that we're examining. As it were, this is our question mark. This is 346. So, and he'll use this term quite a bit, and he'll talk about different question marks, which I quite like. Um, think for instance, you can just pause for a moment and think for yourself, which is what are your question marks? And for instance, maybe as we're reading through this, think about a value you hold in your own life, a moral value. Uh, for instance, I believe you should be compassionate towards people, right? Uh, but maybe as we go through this, make that a question mark and ask yourself, what is its origin and how can I understand this value, even though I take it as an assumption in my daily life? Now, when we talk about the question mark of morality for Nietzsche, Nietzsche admits that in his view, we're already in a late stage moment. We're in an advanced stage of moral development. He says, quote, we've become cold, hard, and tough in the realization that the way of the world is anything but divine. Even by human standards, it's not rational, merciful, or just. So 
I've been thinking here about the way in which we've learned about the natural world. Nature doesn't care about us as human beings. And the more we've developed our knowledge of nature, the more we recognize that nature is not uh, really a moral domain. And this stands in contraposition to, uh, at the time, which was frequently held, which would have been a divine, um, I'm sorry, a natural law theory, namely that there's nature and that God has created the world and nature in such a way that there are moral values. This is roughly speaking what's known as um, natural law theory, that there's natural moral laws. Well, effectively, today science does not even entertain the notion that there are, uh, that there is a natural law, right? It simply appears, and this is some, it simply appears that nature, if you took it from a human perspective, is unjust, cruel, and tragic, um, right? But effectively speaking, the zoologist doesn't think that at all. The zoologist today thinks that the animals are just animals um, and that they don't have moral values or a moral ethos. Uh, so, so that's sort of an interesting thing. So he's, Nietzsche is constantly, on the one hand, recognizing that his position in the history of moral thought is there. He's an advanced late stage, but we'll see. He thinks that his day has not yet come. So, right, in terms of people, when he's writing, he doesn't think we'll actually understand what he's talking about. Uh, so anyway, let's keep going. He says, we've interpreted the world as human beings according to our needs. So the way we understand nature is really driven by what, how we understand what we need out of the world. And think about this. So today, climate change is an issue that people are talking about. And the idea that we need to value, um, you know, that we need to have value, we need to place value in ecology and all the rest of it. You guys, well, how come people didn't care about nature in the past? Well, the answer is because we needed nature. So we interpreted the world according to that need. So it's interesting here, he says, when you're talking about history of morality, he recognized that man, he says, quote, man is a reverent animal, but it's also deeply mistrustful. Um, so there's a way in which um, our moral values, we revere them, but we also don't really always follow them either, right? He says, we've turned our backs on the task of inventing values. So uh, the more we are looking for other people to identify our uh, moral values for us, right, the less authentic our our values really are, right? And he thinks that we as a culture have basically given up on the task of inventing values. I um, mean, I think he would probably still hold that. It's interesting. I think, I think he would, the, the 20th century Nietzsche would recognize that there is a movement towards the reinvention of values. But I think he would also be deeply critical uh, that we've really achieved much. Um, so I don't know. It's interesting. I'd love to know what you guys think as we go through the course here. Um, but we've turned our back on the task of inventing values, he says. And so this is what he says is we're in an age of modern pessimism. And he says that you can compare it. Modern pessimism is, he thinks, something similar to the, the expressions of the teaching of Buddhism. And we're not here going, we're not going to argue whether, discuss whether or not Nietzsche understood Buddhism the way the Buddhists do. Uh, but we'll just say that this is what Nietzsche calls European Buddhism or modern pessimism. And think here that the notion is that if you think about Buddhism, the Buddhists argue that through practice and meditation, you can come to enlightenment. But what is enlightenment? Enlightenment is actually the dissolution of the self. The recognition that everything you're experiencing is actually just thought. And those thoughts come and they go. Um, and ultimately, behind those thoughts is nothing. right? So, enlight And there's different variations of Buddhism. I'm not going to go through all that. There's a whole religious tradition that goes with all of this stuff. But the notion of modern Buddhism is once you recognize that uh, there is no self, right? then you can give up on all these desires you have about the self. Um, and you can essentially um, become, you can um, let go of all the things you're trying to hang on to. Um, so, and it's the view ultimately that at the end of the self, you find there's nothing. And your reaction to that is what characterizes the Buddhist teachings or how you should react to that. Now, Nietzsche's view is that we're in an age of modern pessimism, probably. We're, we're recognizing that beneath all of these things, that we're un uncovering, we're not finding 
that there is a substrate, that there's something that's lasting behind any of it, or that we ourselves are more than just animals. Um, and he says there's a modern pessimism because it looks like our science is confirming well precisely that we are just animals and that there is no fundamental meaning behind everything. So the problem of meaning is huge here, right? So he says what we have to do is we have to, he says we're forced with a choice, which is to either abolish our reverences or ourselves. The latter would be nihilism. But then he says, but would not the former be nihilism? This is our question mark. So we're starting here with the question mark of nihilism. We're going to come back to that as we go. So put it this way. The fact of existence seems to include the idea that there's no inherent value to things. And if that's the case, we either abolish our reverence for those values, which leads to nihilism, or we abolish ourselves, which is also a type of nihilism. Uh, so it looks like the fact of nihilism is... Well, let's put it, he's eventually not going to call it the fact of nihilism. This is what I put here. He's going to call it the um, a psychological condition, a psychological reaction uh, to this problem of existence. And namely, that it looks like the value of existence is given by the valuers, um, us. Um, and if that's the case, what makes our values have any lasting effect? And the answer is, maybe they don't have any. Um, so we'll get to that, right? He says there is in human beings a need to believe. So most people need some sort of faith, he says, in order to flourish. He's, he writes, quote, Christianity, it seems to me, is still needed by most people, even today. Therefore, it still finds believers. And a little bit later, he says, for this is how man is. An article of faith could be refuted before him a thousand times if he needed it. And he would consider it true again and again. And by the way, this is interesting. Just recently, I was teaching a course and I asked all my students to take a quick survey and tell me, you know, did they believe in God's existence? You know, just out of curiosity to begin the discussion. But one of the questions I asked was, if I was able to give you a valid and a sound proof that your view about God is wrong and that the other view is right. So if you're an atheist, I, if I could prove to you that God exists or if you were... A believer, I could prove that God did not exist. If I could give you that argument, would you change your belief? And I would, it's probably not surprising, but the majority, 75% of my students said that no, they would not change their belief even in the face of evidence. Uh, so I found that to be really fascinating. It really kind of confirms kind of what Nietzsche's talking about here. For most of us, our passion of faith is much larger than our will to truth, to use Nietzsche's um, phrase. In this section 349 that I have tentatively titled The Origin of Scholars, what we read is a critique of Darwinism. And I think what's important here is to recognize that Nietzsche, despite the fact that he's talking about that either we need a naturalistic critique of moral morality and moral development, he's not, for instance, down with Darwinism which he finds to be extremely reductive because everything gets reduced to simply the notion of a survival of the in, survival um, of in, an instinct of survival, I'm sorry. And ultimately, or you, as we might put it in a more official capacity, the notion of natural selection. Everything is understood according to that. And Nietzsche thinks that is not sufficient. He writes, the wish to preserve oneself is the symptom of a condition of distress of a limitation of the really fundamental instinct of life, which aims at the expansion of power. And wishing for that frequently, frequently risk and even sacrifices self-preservation. So self-preservation is important, but there's a more fundamental instinct, he thinks, one which has to do with our, no, our attempt to expand our own power and the horizons of our power. And so simply to talk about uh, the struggle for existence and natural selection, is ultimately too reductive. He writes, the struggle for existence is only an exception, a temporary restriction of the will of life. The great and small struggle always resolves around superiority, around growth and expansion, around power, in accordance with the will to power, which is the will to life. So this is where he, he's distinguishing this notion that the will to power is an essential ingredient you need, actually. To, under, to get a naturalistic account of morality and ultimately human beings. So Darwinism, it's interesting, even though obviously Darwin's theory precludes the notion really that you need, that God had to create everything. 
the, the naturalistic account of Darwin is not sufficient either because it ignores for, for Nietzsche the most fundamental will of life with that which he calls the will to power. So the will to power as we go through is going to become increasingly central to Nietzsche's account. Now, the genius of the species, what is that? He says, this is where he talks about consciousness. And here we should recognize, well, what is consciousness? The problem of consciousness means becoming conscious of something, right? It emerges only when we can begin to comprehend how we could dispense with it. So to become conscious of anything requires that in some way we are removed from that thing, separate from that thing, and we become aware of it in a third sense, right? Um, life, he says, could actually exist without consciousness. Um, consciousness is this mirror of reality. And think about it. We're human beings right now discussing the question of what the world means. Well, we're also a part of the world, right? We are literally natural beings existing in this domain of natural things, right? And yet we're conscious of the world. So there's a way in which we're both in the world, but yet uh, observing it simultaneously, right? So life could go on and could exist without consciousness. For instance, when people, we talk about people exploring the galaxy looking for life, it's highly likely eventually, I think, that we will find life. But will we find consciousness? That's really what we're actually interested in finding, I think, when we think about aliens and um, space exploration, is will we find conscious beings, people who are aware of themselves as being in the world, in the universe, um, like ourselves. So what is the purpose of consciousness then when it's so, in the main, just superfluous? And think here about how much of your brain power is actually being used for conscious thought. Um, there's a, and not maybe, I don't mean in terms of the volume or something like that, but the way in which your brain is doing so many things right now, just for you to con listen to me, the consciousness is really just the frosting on the cake of what the mind is actually doing. Um, and taking in as we go through th as we go through life and have these experiences. Now, consciousness is always performed or in a proportion to an animal's capacity for communication. This is actually Nietzsche's sort of interesting thesis and hypothesis is that when we ask what is consciousness and what's the purpose of it, it looks like consciousness is related to our ability to communicate with each other. Uh, and notice here is that as human beings, we communicate with words, we communicate with signs. And I suppose animals do to a certain degree as well. But we have a highly sophisticated um, sign system in which we communicate. And also notice that the more we can't really become conscious of something if we don't have a word to describe it, right? Years ago, there were anthropologists who discovered a village in the villagers, language only had three words, roughly, for color, red, white, and black. And as a consequence, none of the villagers uh, who, d who, only know their native, who only knew their native language were able to actually become conscious of blue as a color. It wasn't until they learned um, you know, uh, another language in which there were more words that they could actually see those colors. So think about it like this, there are phenomena in your experience right now that if there's no sign, if there's no word uh, to way to refer to those things, then you can't really be conscious of those things. So that's very interesting. Um, and I think there's something right about that. It looks like Nietzsche says that consciousness is developed only under the pressure of a need for communication. So that's pretty interesting as well. He says, our actions, thoughts, feelings, and movements enter our own consciousness, at least a part of them do, and that is a result of a must that for a terribly long time lorded itself over human beings. In other words, we, need, we had to develop uh, communication in order to survive, and that communication ultimately leads to this emergence of consciousness. So the development of consciousness and language go hand in hand. But we have to be careful here. Consciousness, therefore, has a social herd utility. And by, it has a social utility. Because remember here, um, communication is, by definition, always a social thing, right? Um, the whole notion of a word has meaning. A word can only have meaning if, uh, if it's used in a social context. If you just make up a word for yourself, um, 
ultimately that word doesn't have meaning because it has no social, let's call it purchase, no social purchase, or to use Nietzsche's phrase, has no herd utility, right? So language is a social construct essentially. And so that means that consciousness has a social herd utility as well. So he says, my idea is, as you see, that consciousness does not really belong to man's individual existence, but rather to his social or herd nature. He says, this means that in the quest to quote unquote, know yourself, one only becomes conscious of what is average. Um, so there's something very interesting there, which is because consciousness itself has is a social um, is a feature of our social ontology. Right, our so the the social system in which we're living, and so that means that the more consciousness we get, we're always grounded and bounded to that herd utility, to that herd nature, and so um, to truly know uh, to know oneself is ultimately just to know the average. Now think about this: today in our society, where we've become accustomed to thinking about these terms in psychological terms, right? Think about how we identify who's mentally healthy and who's mentally instate, unstable or mentally unhealthy, right? We do it always by reference to an average, right? So a person says, I am, uh, I'm a person who's de uh, who has a depressive disorder. Notice that a depressive disorder is something defined uh, by a psychologist according to an assumption of what's average. So this is very interesting, right? It means that knowing ourselves ultimately is also about revealing our herd nature. So our thoughts, however personal, are always getting translated back into the perspective of the herd. So there's a way in which Nietzsche is uncovering this problem in language. Now, quickly, let's talk a little bit about Nietzsche's epistemology, right? Nietzsche says, this is the essence of phenomenalism and perspectivism as I understand them. Owing to the nature of animal consciousness, the world of which we can become conscious is only a surface and a sign world, a world that's made common and mean, common and meaner. Whatever becomes conscious becomes by the same token shallow, thin, relatively stupid, general, sign heard, heard signaling. All becoming conscious involves a great and thorough corruption, a falsification, a reduction to superficialities and generalization. Ultimately, the growth of consciousness becomes a danger. And anyone who lives amongst the most conscious Europeans even knows that it's a disease. So that's a Nietzsche's interesting discussion on consciousness, right? It means that um, the more, quote unquote, we become conscious of the things, the less we actually think about them. This is as, as a consequence of this herd social instinct, right? So Nietzsche really begins, and in this passage, it's interesting because Nietzsche then goes hardcore philosophy, and there's a question about whether or not the subject-object split, uh, whether or not he's denying this. And so in philosophy, we have this notion of the subject-object split. It's the notion that there's things in the world, right? And those things... Um, uh, those things exist in and of themselves, right? And then there's my experience them, my experience of those objects as a subject, right? So, for instance, here's my book. The notion is there's really an object here in the universe, right? Even if I wasn't here, this object would exist in some way. But then I'm a subject and I only experience it. And so the problem of perspectivism for many people is, well, wait a second, you can never get past the subject. You can never get to the object. In other words, the appearance and the thing itself, that distinction basically disintegrates and in fact Nietzsche goes on on page 795 of the t text we're using and he says we don't even know nearly enough to be entitled to such a distinction um, I actually want to read you the rest of the passage because it's so good he says um, he says we simply lack any organ for knowledge right um, for truth, we know or believe or imagine just as much as may be useful in the interest of the human herd, the species. And even what is called utility is ultimately also a mere belief, something imaginary, and perhaps precisely that most calamitous stupidity of which we shall perish some of which shall, we shall perish someday. Right. So Nietzsche is very it's very provocative here. I love it. Um, but you can see his notion here is that um, perspectivism 
is that we have to be a little bit careful um, as we talk about consciousness and knowing the things themselves, the more stupid we can become of things. Um, so I think that's a very interesting insight because of, as a consequence of the, the social role of language. Now in this section, Nietzsche offers sort of a, he has sort of a sustained discussion in 357 on the problem of what is the German. For him, you know, this is an old problem and he really sort of is signaling out what distinguishes German philosophy from other philosophers. And so he looks at three German philosophers, Leibniz, Kant, and Hegel. He talks about Schopenhauer too, but he says Schopenhauer doesn't count as a German philosopher per se, right? I'm not really, I'll be honest with you, as I'm reading this, I'm really not as interested in the question of what he thinks a German philosopher is or what it means to be German, but I'm more interested in the way in which um, he breaks down some of these philosophers in their role, their, in the way in which they play a role in breaking down um, the old world, the, the notion of the transcendental. Now, it's interesting because Leibniz, Kant, and Hegel are all, as it were, not anti-Christian at all. Um, Schopenhauer, I would say, is. Um, but the, these first three aren't. For Leibniz, God is essential. For Kant, God is something that we should respect and rational. Uh, though not no, though unknown. And for Hegel, God is ultimately the final stage of history. So what do we make of all of this? Well, when he talks about Leibniz, he says that Leibniz, for Leibniz, consciousness is merely an accident of experience and not its necessary and essential attribute. So, um, and I don't really want to go into Leibniz, um, looking at Leibniz's work here, but Nietzsche's, what Nietzsche is saying here is that this is one of the first stages towards the development of the philosophy of a future, his philosophy, which is namely that consciousness in Leibniz is reduced down. It's not, it's just an accidental feature of our experience. It's not the necessary and essential attribute itself of experience. So this is interesting. It means that there's a way for the unconscious that becomes opened up in Leibniz's work. When we get to the work of Immanuel Kant, there's a question mark on the problem of causality. And namely, the, this is with reference to Immanuel Kant's famous um, work in the Critique of Pure Reason, where he's responding to David Hume's um, uh, argument that cause and effect relationships in the world are unknown and can never be known. And for Kant, there's a way in which there's, he has his own question mark about causality, and Kant wants to defend the notion that there can be cause and effect relationships, but the only way Kant can do it is by delimiting the sphere of what can be known uh, causally. And this goes back to Kant's famous distinction between the things themselves, the noumenal, and um, things as we experience them, the subjective, or, and so, uh, or the phenomena, excuse me. And Kant's ultimate solution is that we can never know that cause and effect relationships exist numinally or in the world. We can only say that they exist phenomenally. They exist as a priori analytic or a priori um, conditions for our experience itself. For what is, Kant, what is Nietzsche sort of referencing here? Well, the notion that with Leibniz, we saw that consciousness wasn't the essential feature. With Kant, we see that things are reduced further into consciousness, or not into consciousness, but into subjectivity. And with Hegel, we see a dialectic. And Hegel has a philosophy of history, where for him, the history of life on earth, and all the way through social institutions and so forth, ultimately is all leading to uh, the emergence of Geist. So history is a dialectic. But what does that mean? It means that for history, uh, so not for history, for Hegel, logic is a dialectic in which concepts develop out of each other. So what we see in all of these is um, a changing of the equation of what counts in terms of the baseline conditions of what can be known. And you can see all of it is moving in the direction of perspectivism that Nietzsche is discussing. And he also discusses in this passage the atheism and pessimism of Schopenhauer, uh, right? But getting back to the point of morality, what all of this seems to entail is that Christian morality is needs to be challenged and is being challenged and rejected philosophically. And he will reject it. Nietzsche himself will reject it. Now, Nietzsche says there's really two different causes of action. We have to be careful about confusing. And by talking about causes of action, I'm talking about how we understand what motivates us as individuals to act and engage in the world. And he says there's cause of acting in general 
And he says it's a quantum of damned up energy that has to be um, used in some sort of way, right? So there's a baseline condition where we have energy and we have to use that. And then we could talk about just acting in a particular way. Like I want to read my book and so I open the book up and I sit down and I read through it, right? That's a goal-oriented action. Nietzsche's view is that the more that the cause of acting in general is, and, we, and I put here um, to cross-reference Freud, that the cause of acting in general is a psychological, is a condition psychologically. So we might say that the cause of action in one really refers to these unconscious drivers for action. Whereas the second cause is when we use our, our mind and we think, I have a goal, so I'm going to read this book every day until I complete it or something like that. Goal-oriented action is energy that's discharged in a particular way. Now, what's really interesting about this is that Sigmund Freud has the exact, almost the exact same word, uh, way of phrasing this. His view, and of course, I mention him because he's really the first major psychologist, as we conceive of psychology today as being a science, and that's putting aside whether or not his theories are the best theories or not, right? But the basic underlying view of Freud was that human beings have literal energy in our brains and that we have to find ways of discharging that energy and that, that, that our psychological constitution is organized precisely to allow us to do that in a way which will help us flourish and live a good life, etc. And then when we talk about making particular actions, actions that are what? In consciousness, those actions are as it were, they, they rest on top of all of that. That's why, for instance, Freud thought that people frequently will have a reason in their mind for why they're doing one thing, but there's other reasons which are actually underlying their actions. Um, Nietzsche says, quote, people are accustomed to consider the goal as the driving force in keeping with a very ancient error, but it's merely the directing force. One has mistaken the helmsman for the steam and not even always the helmsman, the directing force. So he thinks that what we have to do is we have to analyze this concept of purpose and recognize that every purpose we have has, has as it were, underlying motivating conditions. Um, so the cause of action in general. So I think this is really important. And by the way, I mentioned Freud. Freud himself was criticized for just stealing Nietzsche's ideas. In fact, there was a famous... Um, uh, a conference where psychoanalysts and Freud was there too, where the subject of the conference was whether or not there was really any difference between Freud's work and Nietzsche's. Uh, so there's a heavy influence here between the two or heavy um, similarities. And so, uh, so I, I think that's a really important element in thinking about um, Nietzsche as we go. Now, there's a discussion of romanticism. Well, what is romanticism? I think in general, we can say romanticism is a philosophical movement of the 19th century. And it was one where there was, a, there was an aim philosophically, poetically, and, and culturally to return back to nature. Romanticism is often thought of as a reaction to the Industrial Revolution. What does Nietzsche say? He thinks romanticism is a luxury of culture, <laughs> right? The ability to, to go back and, and think about our relationship to nature and all of these sorts of things. These are these romantic um, drivers are really a symptom or a symbol or a symptom of the luxury of our culture. We're a decadent culture. We can afford to be romantic, right? And here he actually references the birth of tragedy, his first book. And I'm not going to go into that book too much here, but what we can say is that in that book, what's critical is he distinguishes what's called the Dionysian from the, um, the Apollonian, right? And here's the difference between the God of Apollo and the God of Dionysius. Right. Where what Apollo symbolizes is reason, uh, right, where the Dionysian refers to the sensuous. Now, this is what got Nietzsche in hot water as a philologist, because this book said, if you really want to understand these ancient Greek tragedies, you have to understand that there's these two different um, um, uh, what do I want to say? There's these two different elements going on, but that our modern interpretation is just of the Apollonian. We just try to look at these ancient myths in terms of reason and ignore uh, the sensuousness, right? Um, so he references that here, right? And it's, it's a similar sort of thing. He says, quote, every art, every philosophy may be viewed as a remedy and an aid in the service of growing and struggling life. So there's two kinds of suffering, he says. The first kind of suffering is the suffering we get when we have too much of life. We have an overfullness of life. 
And this is where we seek sensuousness or the Dionysian. The other, other kind of suffering is when we have an impoverishment of life. And this is when we don't, we don't feel like we have enough life. And in this case, our natural impulse is to seek reasons to make, to explain this problem. So it's very interesting. There's two types of suffering. You can suffer from having too much of life, but you can also suffer from not having enough of it. Um, so it is, he says, is it hunger or superabundance that has here become creative? So romanticism is, in his view is a reaction to either the over fullness of life or it's a reaction to impoverishment. And I think that Nietzsche would probably say the same in our own day. When we look at our own culture, we recognize that our culture has lots of tensions and problems, etc. There's no shortage of complaints and critiques of, regarding the suffering that takes place in our culture. And think about the way in which we are reacting to that kind of suffering as a culture, right? as a herd. Go to Twitter and look and see how are people reacting to the suffering of life and ask yourself, is this the kind of suffering that is a hunger or a, or a suffering of superabundance? Uh, we know that we can suffer in both ways. And you can just think of it literally, right? People can starve to death, but people can also overeat and kill themselves that way. And maybe there's something similar going on in the type of suffering we see. So he doesn't seem to say whether or not romanticism, maybe it's an, a superabundance here, I'm not sure, uh, but he sort of gives us a choice. Now, science is a prejudice, as a prejudice, right? He says, scientists can never catch sight of the really great problems and question marks, <laughs> right? So he's being critical. And I think he's being critical, particularly of the natural scientist. Um, he criticizes the materialist, right? The materialist is the person who thinks that the world, that, that the world is nothing but just matter and that we can understand all of nature if we just understand the laws which govern the movement of matter. So if you're a physicalist and you think that ultimately your entire life just boils down to the fact that you're a collection of atoms at such and such moment in history, given the laws of nature, right? And you have no choice in your life and, and you're just going to, um, you're just an animal existing according to what necessarily had to happen, right? If you think that and you're a materialist of that type, Nietzsche thinks that that's a problem, right? He's criticizing precisely that view. He says, quote, it's no different with the faith with which so many materialistic natural scientists rest content nowadays. The faith in a world that's supposed to have its equivalent and its measure in human thought and human valuations, right? Now, first off, think about that. What he's really arguing is that the scientist still seems to have some sense of a transcendental guarantee, namely that all of the aspects of nature can be revealed into human thought and human conceptualization and experimentation. In other words, that thought and nature ultimately have some sort of transcendental bind between them. And this really is a vestige of the death of God, I think. He says existence has a rich ambiguity. There's so much we actually don't know in science or about the world. So, quote, a scientific interpretation of the world as you understand it might therefore still be one of the most stupid of all possible interpretations of the world, meaning they would be one of the poorest in meaning. In other words, it's too reductive and it has too much of a prejudice that all things can be known. So by contrast, he thinks when we take on the notion of perspectivism as he's doing, and we think about perspectivism and existence, what we can discover is that there are infinite possibilities, or maybe there are infinite possibilities. He says, on how to interpret the world, right? Our knowledge of existence is always bounded by our perspective. Quote, for in the course of this analysis, the human intellect cannot avoid seeing itself in its own perspectives and only in these. But when we begin to recognize this perspectivism and we give up kind of that materialistic reductionistic view, the world can become infinite again. He says, quote, we cannot reject the possibility that it, meaning the world, may include infinite interpretations. Again, this is the joyful science, right? He's not a pessimist here. This is how Nietzsche is not like Schopenhauer. He's not a pessimist. Um, he's actually excited. Um, he recognizes this challenge that some people take into pessimism, uh, but he himself sees it as an opportunity. Now the wanderer speaks. This is the section 380. Where here Nietzsche is 
arguing that to evaluate the history of morality, we have to become wanderers ourselves. It means we have to give up our own moral prejudices, right? Thoughts and moral prejudice reveal that morality can be seen from the outside, um, some point beyond good and evil, right? Here are some aspects of the problem. He argues that we each have a specific gravity to morality. So each of us has our own moral beliefs that have been um, given to us by our herd, our society, our family. And those moral values are a prejudice in our ability to recognize um, this problem of morality and understand it. And he says that we each have a specific gravity, as it were, right? And we need to be liberated from the many things that are oppressing us so that we can overcome morality, that we can overcome our own romanticism. Now, he also mentions here this notion of the great health, where the notion is that the character of a person who can actually stand outside of this morality is a person who has, quote, great health. Remember, the notion here I think we should think of is he calls the will to power the will to life, right? What is health other than, what is great health other than a flourishing will to life, right? He says, quote, the idea of a human, superhuman well-being and benevolence that will often appear inhuman, for, for example, when it confronts all earthly seriousness so far, all solemnity and gesture, word, tone, eye, morality, and task so far, as if it were the most incarnate and involuntary parody, in spite of all this, it is perhaps with, with, uh, with hum and that greatness really begins that the real question mark is posed for the first time, that the destiny of the soul changes, the hand moves forward, the tragedy begins. And this is, uh, he doesn't really get into it here, but it's, he seems to be issuing forward what he would refer to as a future philosophy, or as it were, the coming of people who could stand outside their own the moral system. They could, as it were, get outside their own specific moral gravity in order to create new values. He says, but these new values, these superhuman people, right, they will appear to us inhuman because for the rest of us, we are still saddled with our moral, um, let's call it our moral upbringing. And as a consequence, they'll look evil to us, even though uh, they're actually doing something creative and something free, right? And by the way, the very end, this is the very end of the gay science. And then the very last things when he talks about this, this is becomes the beginning of his next book, Thus Spoke Zarathustra, who is the Ubermensch, who is the person who overcomes. So the great... The, the gay science effectively is laying out um, the, for, the, uh, the, the possibility of a new philosophy, a philosophy that takes the will to life seriously, um, and, but is ultimately saddled with this problem of perspectivism. Um, okay, let's move here now to on the genealogy of morals here. The genealogy of morals, here's some of the key concepts. What Nietzsche wants to do in this text is he wants to articulate what the origin is of the moral values we hold. So it's a historical analysis. And in this way, Nietzsche is doing a historical philosophy. Um, and he's thinking of the human always as a psychological animal. That is, an animal that has a mental framework. The, in uh, a mental framework that's both conscious but also unconscious. And in terms of his psychology, the will to power is the dominant drive. Now we're going to see that he's going to distinguish at least two different types of moral systems. One he calls master morality and the other he calls slave morality. I think the editors of this edition have tried to choose passages that don't talk about it. The, the, some of the more famous passages in which he discusses this are not here um, in our anthology, but... Um, but he's going to refer to them as master morality and slave morality. And we'll talk about the distinction between good and bad and the distinction between good and evil. And finally, the origin of bad conscience. So that's a kind of a summary of some of the major things we're going to take a look at. Now, what I want to start with here is some of the discussions he mentions from the preface. And the first thing is, in Nietzschean fashion, he emphasizes that we are unknown to ourselves. That we want knowledge about who we are. And we, and with good reason, right? But he says we've never actually sought ourselves. We've never actually looked at who we are. And in order to do that, we need to recognize that a big part of who we are is actually our moral values, uh, the values we hold. And here, just think about the things that you like and the things you don't like. Those are values, 
right? Um, and the way in which you believe you should live a good life and what you're pursuing in your life. These are all your values. But that this morality, if we really want to understand who we are, we have to look at this morality because it's our driving condition in many ways. It is our, quote, a priori. A priori refers to what comes before experience, but he's really thinking of it in terms of someone like Kant, where what's a priori is what comes before um, that thing. So for instance, um, you could say that uh, when you're watching something on your computer, when you're reading something on your computer, the code that's running the computer is a priori to your experience, right? You don't experience the computer code when you're using your computer. It's rather the it's rather by virtue of the computer code that you experience things the way you do. So think about it like that. Your morality is something like your operating code. And it's a priori, which means that it's it's what's governing your actions, not necessarily your conscience. You're not actually choosing all this stuff, right? So the question then becomes, well, what exactly is the real origin of our notions for good and evil, um, right? And he's gonna take a very anti-Kantian perspective, very anti-categorical perspective. And, and you can watch my other videos on Kant if, you, if you're not familiar with Kant's moral philosophy. But Kant argues, for instance, that reason delivers us um, um, an absolute knowledge of what's wrong and what's right through what's something which is called the categorical imperative. Uh, Nietzsche thinks completely goes the opposite direction because, and it's here is important for uh, Kant, moral reasoning is ultimately a posteriori, right? It is not pure reasoning, it's practical reasoning. But here, uh, Kant, uh, Nietzsche is contrasting himself with Kant by arguing that morality is actually an a priori for the human condition. So that, that means that completely transforms the discussion. And it's, it's definitely against Kant's view of the categorical imperative. He says that what we're talking about when, we, when we're trying to develop a science in terms, or at least an investigation into the origin of morality, we have a new demand. Quote, we stand in need of a critique of moral values. The values of these values itself should first of all be called into question, right? Um, so that means that thing, the values, um, uh, these values are today accepted and beyond doubt, he says, for instance. So the values that we hold most dear are the ones that we have to begin calling into question first. For example, compassion. And he discusses the notion of compassion and says that compassion is a terrible value. Um, and so that's a value that most people today, probably including myself, would argue is, is, is accepted without question. So we have to take those into question, right? Is there a system of moral regression is another question he asks here. We're talking about the way in which um, people develop morals, but is it also possible that our morals can regress, that um, our morals can evolve, but also regress? So there's a question here of if our moral values change and can change, then because they're not based on some sort of God, or transcendental guarantee, then what is the movement of moral values and codes exactly? Now, this is sort of moving from the first essay, and I'm just putting these in here so you have a sense of where this stuff is in. I encourage you to read the entire genealogy of morality. It's really great, um, at least very interesting. You may fully disagree with it though. Uh, he mentions here is that it looks like the English psychologists are the ones who prompted Nietzsche's thinking. So you can think about um, the empiricists like David Hume, um, think of Thomas Hobbes, think of these sorts of people who are, and Thomas Hobbes is a great one, right? Where it's the English philosophers who are looking at the way in which the mind works. And they're realizing that the mind doesn't always work um, the way it was assumed it did. And they tend to be very critical um, of the human mind, at least in a variety of ways, right? Think of Thomas Hobbes' argument that all people are really just egoists. And everyone's just really doing what they want and society just exists to basically facilitate our own egos um, and you can think about the way in which the assumption that human beings are naturally selfish and so we our democratic institutions are structured upon that assumption right so he's interested in those people uh, because they're they're doing something similar right but we're going to see he doesn't really he doesn't think they go far enough right he said what is needed ultimately is what we might call as a genealogy of morality but one that's not amateurish where values just originate in judgment right so we need a genealogy of morality meaning that we need to understand the family history of our concepts and how they emerged um, and that's much different than just saying that 
um, that we used our reason and thought, oh, it must be compassion must be a good thing because I would like people to be compassionate towards me or something like that. That the our moral values are just the the result in our judgments about the world because that's not right. Um, it looks like our judgments really arise out of our morality, right? So what do we have to do in order to enable this genealogy of morality? Well, for number one, it has to be based on a pathos of distance. We can't be in the moral code. We have to somehow stand outside of it, right? And so we have to recognize that um, our own role in the problem of the perspectivism here. That means we have to, the task is also to create new values and that involves making and breaking value hierarchies. So we have hierarchies of values. We value some things more or less than other things. Um, but here we have to make and break those hierarchies, right? Um, potentially, uh, or if he says we're going to do it, right? So there's absolutely, any, this is an important point. He says there's no necessary connection, for instance, between the word good and unegoistic actions. Think about the idea of helping someone not to help yourself, but to help them. So for instance, I, it seems very cynical when I see a person helping another person. Let's say someone trips in the street and someone runs out in the street and helps them across, right? And picks up their groceries or something. That looks like a case where someone is doing something that's unegoistic. They're not doing it for selfish reasons, um, or at least it seems mean to say that because what, what, what good do they get out of it? Well, maybe they're getting a psychological um, uh, benefit out of it, right? And so he says there's no connection necessarily between the word good and altruism or selflessness. We'd like to think there is, uh, but there's actually a historical unfolding for why ego, unegoistic actions are taken to be good. And that goal of this essay will be to explore that. And we have to recognize the importance of the herd instinct, namely that all of these values are ultimately constructed out of the herd, by the herd, and for the herd. Now he says, now here we're going to talk about master morality and slave morality in a minute. And I guess I'm going to jump in here and let me just explain it. I'm going to give you a sort of diagram here. So master morality, let's start with that. Master morality is composed of the values of good and bad. So you can see I have master here and then we've got good, a good square and bad. These are the main values. This is the spectrum of values. So when, when something is good for the, in under master morality, it's good because the will to power is satisfied. Remember, the will to power is that fundamental psychological con instinct that we all have, according to Nietzsche. And he thinks that the natural core, the naturalistic explanation for morality would be say, well, if we have this natural instinct to in get more power and to enable our will, this is the will to power, then when we achieve that, that's good. That's what we, so we value those things that help us achieve that or come out of that, um, that enable the will to power, fulfill, satisfy the will to power. And when things don't do that, we consider them bad, right? And so he sees, he calls it master morality because he's thinking of the ancient aristocrats in Rome, for instance, right? Where uh, these people did what they wanted um, and, they, and they got away with what they wanted. There was, master morality was the idea that every man decided what they needed and what they valued and that was acceptable right they weren't evil for doing it uh, in other words you may think of it in terms of egoism fulfilling the ego was good and denying the ego was bad and this is a natural condition in fact ma instead of master morality maybe i would call it just natural uh, naturalistic morality something like that slave morality by contrast emerges and he says slave morality emerges because the slaves have resentment. And in particular, he says he's thinking about the contrast and the conflict between the, the Jewish and the, what would later become the Christian world and the Roman world. So in particular, in another section, his discussion of Jesus Christ, who of course is the very central figure within Christianity, he says that, that Jesus Christ represents resentment more than anyone else is that basically the Jewish people were basically forced under conditions by the Romans. And he thought that what happened was that human beings naturally become resentful when they can't control their own destinies, right? When their power is diminished and they become slaves, 
they see the master or whoever who, or whoever is in charge, they begin to see that person in resentment. And he says that resentment or resentiment is that actually uses this French phrase. Resentiment is ultimately when uh, when the res- people who have this resentment become creative and they become clever and they reverse the values. And so what's good, it becomes the denial of the ego. And what's evil becomes when the ego is satisfied or people try to satisfy it. So in other words, what's good for the master more for under master morality is evil under slave morality. And what's good for slave morality is considered bad under master morality. So let's take a look at these passages. He says, the slave revolt in morality begins with resentment. And what he wants to uncover is, we have this naturalistic account of morality, but in, in European Christian, in the European Christian world, um, in the 19th century, and still in Europe today, there, though maybe not Christian anymore, there is this notion that you should help people, right? that you should be compassionate towards people, that it's not just about satisfying the ego, but it's ultimately doing what's best for others, right? Altruism. And his argument here is that where does that moral development arise? How does it even come into being? And he thinks it's through resentment and through the psychology of being a slave ultimately, or being enslaved or um, subordinated to others. He writes, quote, in order to exist at all, slave morality from the outset always needs an opposing outer world. In psychological terms, it needs external stimuli in order to act. Its action is fundamentally reaction. The opposite is the case with the the aristocratic mode of evaluation. This action grows spontaneously and only seeks out its antithesis in order to affirm itself more thankfully and more joyfully. So the notion here is that the ma- under the master morality moral system, right, actions are determined uh, spontaneously out of what is good for the individual, right? Uh, so it's very simple and easy to understand. But slave morality reverses this ordering. He says, after resentiment comes cleverness. Quote, a race of such men of resentment is bound in the end to become cleverer than any noble race as a first condition of existence, right? So this is what he thinks is happening, that you have these two different moral systems that it develops. And he particularly says that he thinks that the old moral values in the ancient Greek world here, and he also says it's not just Greek. He says that the master morality exists in all of these different cultures. So it's not just um, Europe, but he says master morality exists in Asia. It exists everywhere where there are human beings living in a natural condition. But the type of morality that arises uh, that we have today in the 21st century, this moral system arises out of the conflict between the master morality of the Romans and the slave morality that gets invented out of um, Christianity. And so, for instance, this is why, for instance, Nietzsche has a book called The Antichrist. And he has, you know, he's going to talk about he's very much anti-Christian because he thinks that what we have to do is now, particularly with the death of God, this moral system has no basis. The moral system that should pertain is really this naturalistic uh, master moral system. Um, but that's one where the master decides creatively what values are worth holding and which ones are not. Right. So what does this mean about culture? Because remember, the herd instinct is an essential element in all of this, given language and given our psychology and all the stuff that he's mentioned. So what is culture? Culture is essentially, quote, to breed a tame and civilized animal a domestic animal from the predatory animal man. In other words, culture is the way is the is the mechanism by which these values get instilled within us. Morality is one of the instruments of culture. Think of the word culture as agricultural, right? Agriculture, right? In other words, to cultivate is to grow something. And notice when in farming, whenever you grow, you also have to kill, right? So to grow plants means you have to kill weeds. Right? In the same sense, morality is one of the instruments of culture, which grows human beings, grows uh, humankind, Nietzsche thinks, into becoming a civilized animal, but what has been destroyed in its place, the will to power. He says, consider that, I'm not, he doesn't say this, but I'm saying this, we can consider, for instance, the, cultural, the, the problem of cultural relativism here. 
we know for a fact that every culture seems to have distinct categories and values, different moral systems. Why would that be the case? Well, the answer is because every culture has found different forms of moral life um, to use as instruments in order to tame the population and maintain the herd, maintain the herd, right? He says, but the th issue is the distinction between the subject and the action. The idea that there's a difference between the person and the thing they do is a false distinction. And this is really important because he thinks that if we look to slave morality, in particular, if we look to Christian moral ethos, what we see is there's a difference between the internal life of a person and the actions those person um, enacts, the things, those, the, the things that that person will do. Right? And notice we often judge on this category. We say, for instance, that he may have done something bad, but he did it for a good reason. Or um, uh, he didn't, she didn't quite understand what she was doing when she acted and so on and so forth. All of that, all of that kind of moral discourse assumes there's a dif difference between me as a subject and an experiencing consciousness uh, individual and the actions I'm doing. And he says this is a false distinction. He says, quote, no such substratum exists. There's no being behind the doing, acting or becoming. The doer is merely a fiction imposed on the doing. The doing itself is everything. Now notice this is a very, uh, in order to understand this, uh, this is a central point for existentialism overall, right? Namely that what takes place in the domain of uh, being in the domain of the actual lived existence is fundamental, right? The rest of this, our concepts, the notion that I'm a doer, that I'm a person doing this thing is actually a fiction that we impose after the fact. It's a necessary fiction, I think, uh, but it's fiction nevertheless, right? Slave morality, what it discovers is faith in the indifferent, freely choosing subject. So his notion here is that this distinction between the doer and the doing is important for slave morality. Because remember, this person who is enslaved doesn't have any choices, right? Those are imposed upon them by the master. And so slave morality basically says, well, I have no choice in my actual doings. And so instead, I posit that I'm a doer. And so my freedom is retained, right? And it's within that freedom that the cleverness of the slave is able to become creative and create a new moral system where good and bad are um, inverted into good and evil. Now, here's a discussion here, and this comes from the second essay of the Genealogy of Morality, and there's an, um, which is making promises. How do we get to the spot in more moral life where we begin to make promises? How has this ability even come about? And here we have a psychological argument. He says, first off, we should consider the countervailing force of forgetfulness. And here the notion is uh, we naturally do want to forget things. So no one really remembers everything, nor would we want to. He says, quote, the temporary shutting of the doors and windows of consciousness that help guarantee freedom from disturbance by the noise and struggle. So if we think about as the human being, uh, as humans through all of the generations and iterations slowly began to develop their social moral ethos, right? Uh, life is just struggle in all of that. And so the ability to forget is essential. If you can't forget about things, you can't, if you can't let things go, then they become a burden to you. You've probably even heard that or you've experienced that, that truth on your own, which is namely that there's a time when you have to let things go. Right. So it's the only way we can be free, ultimately, at least be able to avoid the noisiness of our struggles. And so that means that forgetfulness is a natural kind of force that we have as human beings, because it's what enables us to actually kind of probably enjoy our lives. Um, now, the memory of will. So um, here we have to realize that we do also through the will, we can create memory. Um, and here we're not talking about the notion that we have memory. But we're talking about the notion of a social memory, moral values understood as a type of memory. He says the long history of the origin of responsibility comes out of a morality of customs that are imposed on a culture over time. And over time, this gets compressed into a dominant instinct. 
And this is what we call the conscience. So when I talk about, when I have this sense that I'm doing wrong or I'm doing bad, let's call it the bad conscience. I realize that I'm acting bad. Let's say I lie to my wife and then I feel bad about it, right? This feeling of moral guilt, which Kant talks about as well. But Kant says that's a re realization that there's a universal moral duty. Not so with Nietzsche. For Nietzsche, the conscience is the consequence of um, customs and culture compressing themselves into us over time into the fact that eventually they just become an instinct. So I don't even know why it's wrong. I just feel that it's wrong, right? And he thinks this is probably a necessary feature to the development of um, human beings overall. Now, pain is one of the techniques for remembering, right? If you want to remember something, remember the pain, right? Um, for instance, my, uh, my mom used to tell me, she said, I, I, my, she, she told me that when she was a, a little girl, her mother told her, never put your hand on a hot stove. And the first thing she did is she put her hand on a, for, on a hot stove. And my mom famously told me, or at least famous for me, she said, I'll never do that again. Pain will help us remember things more easily than, than pleasure, I think, right? Because we want to avoid pain. So, quote, things never proceeded without blood, torture, and victims. When man thought it necessary to forge a memory for himself, the worse man's kind's memory was, the more frightening its customs appear. With the help of such images and procedures, one eventually memorizes five or six I will nots, thus giving one's promise in return for the advantages of society. Uh, so, we have this notion here is that he, in, in, in the, some of the passages that are unfortunately not in our anthology, but are in at Nietzsche's actual text, he, he really lays out a history of torture, for instance. And you realize that, that he says, if you look at human history, it's basically a nightmare of torture and murder and bloodshed, right? What's going on here? Hegel thought it was part of the development of spirit or something like this. But Nietzsche says, no, what's happening here is through all of this pain and torment and suffering that eventually the conscience is being instilled within the herd, right? And he says, for instance, every instinct that is not vented out, every sort of instinct you have where you want to do something but you can't get it out, turns inward. In contemporary psychology, this is called the problem of sublimation. That when you can't have an instinctual drive met or satisfied, you find some other way to achieve it. And what Nietzsche thinks is that you, people had an instinct of a will to power to do what they wanted, but um, eventually through this compression of, or culturation, which really just involves violence um, and suffering, that through all that process, eventually this instinct turns inward into itself. Um, and then when it does so, this instinct becomes a way of, uh, that, that's really the development of the bad conscience. Right now, at this point, he'll even mention something that's again the promise of the future, and this is the notion of Nietzsche's concept of the Ubermensch or Overman. This is the person in the future who is not who stands outside the moral order and instead who will look inhuman to us, but who will create new moral values, right? Because they're no longer they no longer have what we call it, the um, the specific gravity of the 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 morality and the culture. And Nietzsche thought there were Ubermensch, like Caesar Augustus um, or um, Napoleon Bonaparte, right? These people, he sees them as Ubermensch. Um, and famously, he thought maybe Wagner was, but he changed his mind on Wagner. And there's a whole discussion about Wagner here that I'm skipping over, uh, but that is pretty interesting. But what is the promise of the future? Nietzsche says, this man of the future who will redeem us as much from the previous ideal as from what was bound to grow out of it from the great disgust, from the will to nothingness, from nihilism, this midday stroke of the bell, this toll of great decision, which once, once again liberates the will, which once again gives the earth its goal, and man his hope, this anti-Christian, anti-nihilist, this conqueror of God and of nothingness, he must come one day. So basically Nietzsche's view is that, remember, since he's doing a historical study of morality, the question is, where does morality go from here? And he thinks the answer is eventually it goes into a place that is the opposite of the Christian moral system, but it's also the opposite of nihilism. It, it is it is not just it's not just the throwing up the hands and saying nothing has meaning. 
And nor is it the, the person who says, well, I'm waiting for God to tell me what my value is. It's this other person, this person who can stand outside of both, right? And this is the notion of the Ubermensch. So I'm going to end here with just a couple slides here on the notebooks from 1884 to 1888. And just some of those passages on nihilism, because we ended here the genealogy by discussing nihilism. So what is nihilism, right? Well, we know that nihilism really is a problem philosophically in the sense that the problem of nihilism is the idea of whether or not there is meaning to anything, whether or not really there is no meaning, right? So what are the three different basic forms of nihilism? Well, one form of nihilism, Nietzsche says, emerges when a seeker finds no meaning, right? So when you're trying to, let's say, for instance, I'm, someday I'm going to be an old man. Maybe you already think I am. But someday I'll be an old, if I'm lucky, I'll be an old man. And let's say that I look back on my life and I say, what was the meaning of my life? Did, I ha did my life have value? And what if I find that I conclude that no, my life didn't have any value, right? And think about all the different people who've lived short, cruel lives, whose lives are really not, no, there's nothing uh, noteworthy about them, right? We sort of live like their lives don't have meaning. So when a seeker finds they have no meaning, that's one of the forms of nihilism, right? And so the person who, the death of God, for instance, is this first type of nihilism, as it were. Uh, number two, when one has postulated a totality, a systemization, even an organization, all that happens beneath, all that happens. So another type of, of nihilism occurs when we begin to recognize that there's a to totality and a systemization to everything. Everything is organized, everything is answered, everything is made sense of. When we're in that situation, we also can react by thinking there's no real meaning in this because it's just a singular totality. And we can think here about the individual versus, um, versus uh, the, the herd or the group, right? Um, for instance, Hegel argued that the individual just plays a little role for the overall species, right? Um, or think about the soldier in the army. It's the army that is the totality. The soldier is just one little element in it. When we recognize that the, if we think that, that everything is just of this totality, nihilism can result. Another way in which nihilism can result is when one affirms a disbelief in the metaphysical world. And this is when we recognize, for instance, this is also related to the God is dead element of it. When we recognize that there is no metaphysical world like Plato or, or thought or like Descartes thought or like Kierkegaard thinks of as well. When, if we begin to affirm a disbelief in metaphysics, then he says nihilism will also result or it can result. And again, it's a normal psychological condition given these kinds of features and factors. So what are the reactions to nihilism? There's two main types. You can either be a passive nihilist. You can react passively, what he calls European Buddhism, by essentially admitting that there is no meaning to things and essentially withdrawing from activity in the world. The other possible reaction is active nihilism. An active nihilism is precisely the kind of nihilism that we're talking about with regard to the future Ubermensch or future philosopher. And there the notion seems to be that uh, we can react by becoming creative, by inventing new values. Even if those values don't hold permanently, we work to will them into power, right? Now I'm going to end with one last thing here. Those are just a couple comments from the notebooks on nihilism, which I think are helpful and interesting. The final thing is what's known as the eternal return. The eternal, which he mentions briefly in our passage, but he doesn't really explain, so I thought I'd just talk a little bit about it to end the, the video today. The eternal return is the notion, uh, put it this way, I'll phrase it in my own words. Imagine, for instance, that the universe has an inf is an infinite in time. That means that the universe will just go on forever and ever. But let's also imagine that the, there's only so much of the universe that the universe is finite. Now, interestingly enough, this seems to be the case given contemporary cosmology. Now, it's true we think the universe is expanding, but there is a limit to the universe. The universe is actually finite, right? So let's imagine those two conditions. And, and we're not going to really, this is not a scientific theory, so we're not going to pretend that it is. But let's imagine those two conditions persist. That means that all of us are made of matter. And let's assume there's no God too, given Nietzsche's philosophy. 
That means that let's assume that all of us are made of matter. We're made of atoms and molecules that disintegrate and get recombined into different forms right after we die and so on and so forth. But that means that if there's an infinite amount of time and a finite amount of stuff, all things that have, have happened will eventually happen again, maybe very, very far down the line. But eventually, all things that have happened will happen. And if we also extended the infinity of time backwards, we could say that all things that are happening have already happened, right? Now, not just them, but all possibilities have effectively happened. Now, think about it like that. Imagine, for instance, that you, um, that your life, you're actually living the same life you've already lived. Let's imagine that it's true, which means that not only like the, all the experiences you've had, right? That the boyfriend or the girlfriend who wronged you, right? The person you fell in love with, the person who died, who was in your life, who mattered so much, the mistakes you've made, all of those things in your life will happen again and have been happening infinitely forevermore. If that's the case, there's a question about whether or not your life has meaning, right? Notice here, this is, I'm postulating the second form of nihilism. We postulate a totality, a systemization. And we recognize that we're just a little cog in the wheel of that system, right? It raises for us this question of, is my life meaningful? Are my choices actually my own? And you can see here, there's an inch, two different reactions to that. If I gave you that scenario and I told you that everything that has happened in your life is just going to happen again, right? And you wouldn't know it. It would just happen exactly again. If you find that that's meaninglessness, if nihilism is your reaction, then there's a question here that the existentialists really are posing for you, which is why don't you change how you live your life? After all, it's the doing which matters. And if you're, by contrast, said, yes, that would be a joy for me to know that the life I'm living now is a life that I will always live, right? Then, for instance, maybe you're in a good place <laughs> as, a, um, <clears throat> as an existentialist, because in that sense, you have an active reaction to nihilism um, or to the problem of nihilism. So this is the notion of the eternal return, which plays a really interesting I think the um, thought experiment kind of role in Nietzsche's philosophy. Well, that concludes my discussion of Nietzsche's philosophy in understanding logic. Obviously, there's so much more we could talk about with Nietzsche. He's such a prolific and a brilliant thinker, but I'm hopeful that this discussion today and this lesson will really help you understand not just some of the basic concepts in Nietzsche, but also a little bit about some of the more intricate arguments he actually makes. Thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you guys online next time.